Thank you very much, Rolf. That was very inspiring. I said I wouldn't ask a question to let uh, people ask questions, but I have this burning question in my mind. If you guys allow me, I'll, uh, I'll ask this first. You don't have to spend a whole lot of time on my question. Um, I was thinking of, of uh, my previous life, and, and it must, must reflect a lot of people's lives. When you're in working in a corporation and there's pressure, there's competition, and it's either you get promoted or, or you get left behind, and, um, and then you advocate for modesty. If, you, if you're modest, you're not gonna get anywhere in, in an aggressive environment in the corporate world. Like how do, you, how, do you, how do you deal with office politics, with the pressure of people saying terrible things about you and you don't have time, you have a lot of work on your desk and, and you worry about, worry about your promotion, your friends are getting promoted, and you're being left behind. How do you, how do you balance all of these pressures? Oh, there's a lot of toxic, toxic emotions here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one of, one of it, okay, the friends are getting promoted and I, I don't get promoted. So that's the, that's the envy part. So we envy people, we have to understand how envy works. So envy is one of the modern diseases that we have. And, um, and envy works, you will compare yourself with people who have a similar job or a similar study like you, who are a similar age and, and, and work in roughly the same, uh, or live in roughly the same neighborhood. So you will not, as a, you know, you will, as a, as a let's say, a dentist, you will not be envious of, of, uh, of somebody who is also a great dentist, but makes 10 times the amount of money on the other side of the globe. It just leaves you cold. But if your neighbor is a dentist and he makes 10 times the money, that really drives envy. So it's, it's physical proximity, it's the same job and roughly the same age. Um, I used to be envious um, <laughs> of, of other writers who are more successful than I am, um, but I was never envious of Roger Federer. He's from Switzerland too, he's about my age, but it's a different category, okay? <laughs> it's, it's tennis, I can't go. It's, it's funny how envy works. So it, it really, once you know how envy works, you can consciously not compare yourself with people who have the same job and who are roughly are in your neighborhood and have the same age, consciously not do that. It's, it's hard, it takes a little bit of practice, but you can get rid of that. Another um, reason why, how you can control envy, there are a couple of tricks also in my books. My book, one is the focusing illusion. Uh, when we compare ourselves to other people, we usually compare it on one dimension. So we take one aspect of their life and make it really big. So I have a small car, the other guy just bought himself a huge Porsche or whatever, and I think that Porsche really makes the guy's life dramatically different. And that's the focusing illusion. Because if you look at the moment to moment life of my neighbor, that Porsche doesn't really matter. His moment to moment life doesn't really have a big effect on his life. He, he has his toothaches and he has his arguments with his friends or his wife and he thinks about death and he's afraid of old age and he has his stress and whatever. And that little Porsche that sits there has almost zero effect on his life. But when we compare, we make that one factor really big in our head, and once you know that effect, you can, you can decrease mm. that amount. And then, if I may, just do a little excursion. Once you realize also that chance, randomness plays a huge part in our lives. So you can say the guy was just lucky to be more successful, or the guy was just lucky to have 10 times the salary than I, that I have. Um, I know this doesn't come across right when we say luck has, plays a huge role, because we always think, no, no, it's, it's really, it's us that drive success. It's, it's, it's up to us to be successful. If we want it, we can change the world, we can build this corporation. No, it's not true. It's really not true. <coughs> A lot of it is, is, is randomness. Look at your IQ. Your IQ is genetically determined. IQ plays a huge role in today's society. It makes a huge difference if you're successful or not. Your income depends on, on IQ dramatically. In the past, it wasn't the case. In the past, it was muscles or how fast you could run. It was other things, but not IQ. IQ is, is genetically determined. You had no influence on, on your gene composition. You didn't pick your parents, and you didn't pick the way that those DNA strands put together. So you have it, 
since you're here at LSE, uh, you have, you're the lucky winners of the uh, uh, IQ lottery, um, us too, but there are a lot of people who are just, are not the lucky winners. You didn't pick your parents, by the way, also in terms of how they, you know, the, the, uh, how, how they raised you. you. I could have easily fallen into a family that of, of, of drug addicts or people who are sitting in front of TV and, uh, and are, are uh, ho homeless people or whatever. I, I was lucky to be brought into a family of hardworking, really wonderful parents. I didn't pick my parents. I didn't recruit them. I didn't have a recruiting process. Um, <laughs> and pure luck. Also, the luck that you were born into the you know, 20th or 21st century uh, is a great, I mean, we have a great time. We could have easily been, you know, fallen into the, the, the 30 years war time. Or the fact that you were born in, in Britain and not in Bangladesh or North Korea or Yemen. Could have easily born, be born in North Korea, but you'll you be born into this society, which is a great society, or Europe generally. So a lot of it has to do with chance, with randomness, with luck. And now you say, well, but the success I have, you know, this doesn't come from nowhere. I can't just sit in front of TV and then I have my success. Of course not. You need willpower to do it. But where does willpower come from? Think about it for a moment. Where does your drive come from? Your drive is partly genetic. We know this from psychology. Part of it is genetic. There are some people who just don't have that much willpower. Some people generate willpower much more easily. And then a second factor is also the role models you had in your youth. And again, you didn't recruit your parents. You had your role models. And willpower also has to do with chance and luck and randomness. So the, the belief that we can do whatever we want and it's, all, it's only us who determine the future is not true. The, 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 the chance and the, 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 the component of, of, of luck is huge in our lives. And that also decreases envy. So we can just say the guy is lucky who has uh, 10 times the amount of money. All right. Um, let's open for questions from the audience. Uh, I'll be taking three questions at a time. That way more people can ask their questions. This gentleman here. Oh, Hello? before, before oh. you ask a question, please make sure there's a question in the end. <laughs> Some people <laughs> forget the question mark. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think, do you hear me? Hello? Yes. yes. Uh, so I'll save you some time, I have two questions. Um, <laughs> so first of all, Rolf, thank you very much for very interesting presentation. That was very useful. I, I will use some tips even today. And um, <clears throat> the, my first question is, uh, where is love? You, all, all of your philosophy is based on, on fortress kind of principle so what life is pushing on me, I'm defending myself, I self-preserve myself and stuff. But how you can talk about good life without love? Right, that's the first question. The second question, uh, what is the purpose of good life? Wow, okay. Yeah. Another, can you, th 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 yes. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I have a question more on measurement of happiness. You were talking about uh, some of the studies that use, you know, these surveys that ask someone, are you happy on a scale from one to four, and then they use that to measure happiness. So what do you think about uh, this measurement? Do you think it's a good way to measure it? Are there other ways to measure it, and what do you think is the best way? If you think it's a good way, does that mean that but Bhutanese citizens have your Swiss army knife and that's why they're the happiest in the world? Or? Yeah, yes, please. Um, I'll, I'll go, um, I'll go there uh, next. Yes. Many thanks for your presentation. Uh, my question is, are there any unintended consequences if everyone or most people start living the good life? <laughs> 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 All right, so uh, the first question is, where is love? Yeah. Um, Good life without love? <laughs> yeah. I mean, love is usually important, but you cannot force it. You cannot 
really force love. It even either happens or it doesn't happen, but you can appreciate if it's here. So this is also one of the, let me give you an answer on, again, from, from Epictetus. I love my children and my wife, of course, but let me talk, just talk about my children. Um, we have two little twins, and when I kiss them goodnight and put them to bed, I always tell myself, and that is straight from Epictetus, this is not my child. This is on loan from the universe, and the universe can take it away any moment. It might not wake up alive tomorrow. And when you think about this, the fragility of life and the fragility of love, you will experience it much more, much more strongly. I know it's, it sounds like a brutal thought of thinking about the death of your own child, but it makes you appreciate much more what you have. Again, it goes back to almost the, the mental uh, subtraction idea. So I kiss uh, one of my boys or, uh, you know, and put him to bed, and I say, this is on loan from the universe, it's not my child. Um, so this is kind of the love thing. I, I don't believe you can force love, but I don't know any studies on how we, if you can push love or, or not love. I don't think there, I don't know of any of those studies. The purpose in life. There is a big purpose and there is a small purpose. Um, and I, I, I did differentiate between the two. One is, what is the purpose that we are here on the planet? You know, what is the purpose of the universe? What is the purpose of, you know, of life generally? You know, science hasn't found a purpose. Um, there's no purpose that you can dissect anywhere. It just happens, it's an evolving process from the Big Bang on and it just kind of evolves. So there's no purpose in the universe, but there is a small purpose, I call it small purpose, and it's the purpose you set yourself in life. These are your life goals. Um, it's good to have goals in life. It actually helps you attain those goals, but you should not be chained to your goals. Again, um, there is a, there's a great study out there. They asked people, uh, students, how important is income or financial well-being, financial success in your life? And those people who have given, uh, as students, who have given a high rating, you know, that's very important to me, they actually, with a much higher degree, achieved um, those goals. They were much richer, they had more wealth 20 years later. But, and here comes the but, those guys who gave a high rating, you know, this is important to me, and didn't achieve it, were miserable. So you shouldn't chain yourself to the goal. Um, you should be kind of flexible when you set goals, because once you chain uh, yourself, you set yourself up for misery, because again, the, the, the role of randomness and chance is huge in life, and it might just play against you, and then you're gonna be, feel miserable for the rest of your life. So that's kind of the purpose discussion. How do you measure happiness? There are two measurements, happiness, um, and they totally contradict each other. <laughs> One is the general life satisfaction. So you ask people generally, overall in your life, how satisfied are you with your life? So people reflect back on their lives and kind of make, make a mental, make, mental calculation. Overall, I'm a four out of 10 or, you know, this was a one to four, so I'm a, a 2.7. That's one way of, of, of asking the question. Then there's a second way of asking the question is, at the moment, how happy are you? And that, is, that gives you a completely different reading. So the, the technique, how it usually works, is you get pinged with a, with a text message and you type in your score at the moment, how you feel at the moment. And that moment-to-moment -moment feel is usually lower than the overall feel. It's funny, but it's, it's just as it is. That's usually a lower score. Now, which one, which one counts now? Is, is the moment-to-moment -moment happiness? Daniel Kahneman calls it the experiencing self. Is that the right measurement stick? Or is the overall, how happy are you generally with your life, the right one? We don't know. There's not, we don't know which one is more important. Mm -hmm. But we know when we look back and we kind of analyze our lives, generally how happy are, are we, we tend to project a lot of stuff in it. So we make up a lot of stories about ourselves and we kind of, sometimes lie to ourselves. Uh, and the, the, I would say that the moment to moment is, is more truthful, but again, it doesn't tell you much about an overall structure. So these are the type of things and it hasn't been reconciled. And I don't think there's a way to reconcile it. 
and the, the people in Bhutan. Um, people in Bhutan are very happy, but you must know that in Bhutan you have a, a, a two-tier society. You have immigrants from India who do all the dirty work. All the road work that is being done there, uh, you have an underclass in Bhutan who does all the dirty jobs. And of course you can be super happy if you're Bhutanese and you can be very high on the thing, but you should also consider uh, everybody who lives in Bhutan. And those statistics usually don't consider everybody who lives in Bhutan. Actually, if you look at OECD countries, there's a statistics, and every year that statistics is updated of all the OECD country, the happiness, the general happiness, how ha generally happy are you? And it's usually the Scandinavian countries and Switzerland who, that are on top. And there is a professor, uh, Bruno Frey, uh, he's a Swiss guy who actually started the econo economic happiness research, and he found it's very much tied with how much influence you have on a political scale. So. Those countries, it, it's one factor of many factors, but it has an impact of how directly can you affect society and how directly can you affect um, policies as an individual. If you have more control over it, like we in Switzerland, we, get, we, we, we have to vote on everything every week. We have something to decide. Um, <laughs> You know, should, should, he, should, he plant a, you know, should he plant a tree here in the city or should he plant it over there? I mean, be continuously being asked to, to vote on stuff. But it gives you a sense of, 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 of control over the direction of where society goes. And that is a very strong factor that makes for a good society or happy, happy people. Oh, that's, uh, that's good. Um, yeah, let's go. Not the uh, unintended consequences. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's oh, a very sorry, brilliant, that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> brilliant. What if everybody has a good life? Um, I, I would love to have. I would love to have that. Just imagine you would have a life, a, a society where everybody is humble, doesn't have a big ego. It would make for a very robust society. I would love to live in one of those. Um, seriously, I would, it would be a good one. Okay, so let's uh, let's take questions from upstairs. Let me see. There is a, a woman in the back. Yes. Thank you. I was just wondering. I really don't mind paying taxes. What what I mind is when other people don't, and when they use elaborate legal and other routes to not pay those taxes. And what's the the toolbox? What's in the toolbox for dealing with that kind of thing? Or is it just you have to be in action to make a difference in that regard? Okay. Yeah, there's a uh, man here. Um, so in, in order to use the uh, mental models you've spoken about, you need to have uh, or to be self-aware uh, that your view uh, or is wrong or your decision could be wrong. So how have you become self-aware to use the tools that you are prescribing? And then a sneaky second question is, uh, who or what books have uh, influenced your writing around decision making and mental models? Okay. And then, oh, a lot of people. There's a gentleman here in front. Thank you. Um, there's, there's been a lot of talk in, in the business world around business psychology about being world class and continually developing and growing. And it's a journey rather than a destination. But what mental tools can you recommend to deal with the constant failure of not being perfect? <laughs> Very interesting questions. Great. OK, on, on taxes and cheating on taxes. Um, you know, I come from Switzerland, and Switzerland has been uh, one of the drivers on cheating taxes internationally. Um, we've changed. Uh, now you can't, you know, you, you can't do the game anymore, and, and the banks really don't ha have to find different income streams in Switzerland. Um, but there's no, not one single, I mean, there's not a mental tool for it. There's only regulation for it. So you need policy decision, you need enforcement that people can't cheat on their taxes. Um, th th the thing is that there are so many loopholes in almost every country when you have a certain income and you have a certain um, 
a certain if you have cor if you have a corporation a perf you know a private corporation and you do it through a corporation there's so many loopholes that you can still optimize kind of taxes or cheat on the taxes i think we just have to close this it, it takes some it, it costs money to close these things but i think the net effect will be financially beneficial to the country and and second of all it will be uh, it will be fair you know we are used to from a mental point of view we have a hunter and gatherer brain we have a stone age brain and the stone age brain is is made for a almost um, egalitarian society we used to live in in small groups of about 50 people hunting and gathering and we were extremely egalitarian so we are used that this makes us happy which means if some people rich people cheat on their taxes and they're extremely rich on top of it and then cheat on their taxes um, this really gets into our on our nerves and there is a reason for it and that's the stone age brain of of of, uh, of having a very um, equal society at the time um, I had uh, lately in, in Switzerland you you can move from Canton to Canton we have these areas and the tax differences are huge generally people uh, you can pick and and and, and move uh, to a, a very ugly place and pay almost no taxes um, and a lady came to me a few weeks ago and said you know I moved to this and this place it's really ugly I moved to this and this place and I'm gonna save five million taxes per year you know five million pounds of taxes per year I'm like okay so if you have if you can save five million in taxes you have enough money to live at a nice place I mean you only have one life you know what kind of calculation is this to optimize taxes and then you live in 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 Riyadh where you pay no taxes or in 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 Monaco uh, at some uh, concrete building uh, what kind of life conception is that you know uh, being having a, having a really bad environment having an ugly environment to save some some bucks so I, I think um, a lot of people over over judge the importance of taxes you, basically just pay those taxes and and if you can pay the taxes you know that you're you're lucky enough you have the genetic composition you have had the success you have had that component of luck so by all means just give it to the guys who are born with less fortunate genes into the less you know into a, into a household that is not as fortunate into the wrong zip code you know they by all means give some money what I don't like with taxes if if they are spent in a inefficient way so if bureaucracy bureaucracy eats up a lot of it so it has to be spent in an efficient way from my point of view self-awareness how can you be self-aware of these 52 mental tools mental models it's it's it helps to know those labels and I've tried to make those labels that stick you know five seconds uh, uh, you know five second no and you kind of snappy titles it helps to have those snappy titles in your head and then you will recognize which tool you can use if you don't have the labels it's kind of hard and I've done the same thing with my previous book the art of thinking clearly where I have kind of snappy titles for those biases and it helps to 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 know them so those titles help and then of course it's a matter of training you know I'm not perfect with these 52 um, I am by far not have not achieved ataraxia no, no, the perfect inner uh, fortress but by doing it you get better every year and uh, I know I'm not going to achieve it 100% but I'll get better every year now the positive influences on on this well it's a stoic philosophers but then also I quote a lot Charlie Munger and Charlie Munger actually came up with the term mental models I use mental tools but he came up with mental models he calls he calls it a lattice work of mental models you, when you look at the world there's never one certain one single perspective to look at the right perspective you have to look at it from different venues you have to kind of have models to interpret the world from different domains and I love Charlie Munger's uh, conception of mental models I think model is the wrong term because with models I think you know an architecture model of a city you make it small so it's kind of the wrong term but the idea behind it is, is brilliant so that's Charlie Munger's and I have a lot of brilliant stuff from Charlie Munger in the book I just love the guy 
Yeah. He's, he's a modern Stoic, so he, he's truly a modern Stoic. <laughs> and then what was the last question? Constant, how do you deal with the constant failure of uh, not being perfect? Yeah, your life will never be perfect. Um, you just notice. I mean, eventually you'll come to realize your life is not going to be perfect. Life is tough and shit is going to be thrown at you and you will make tons of mistakes all the time. You will never be perfect. Just accept it. You can get incrementally better, but you'll never re reach that perfect level of, you know, I'm the perfect entrepreneur, I'm the perfect CEO. No CEO is perfect, no entrepreneur is perfect, no person has a personality is perfect. We will make mistakes and life is hard enough and um, just accept it.